For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. Hits with me one more moment. Martin, uh, Marvin Lewis, we've been praying for you today. I was praying for you before the service and your son. We're glad to have you with us today. If you'll bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, once again, God, I humble myself before the throne of God. And I ask, Lord, today that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon me as your messenger. Help me, O Lord to deliver the word of the Lord that you placed in my spirit for the people of God at this hour. Oh God, how we need to hear from heaven today. If ever the church has needed to hear from heaven, false prophets abound within the church world and they lead the people of God astray. They lead them after worldly power and influence. They lead them after a political influence and power. But Lord, we understand today that the true power of God is in the truth of your word. It is in the reality of the presence of the Holy Ghost. It is in the preaching of the cross. Help us, Master, today to deliver the word of God faithfully and allow God every ear that today would hear to receive the word of God. Lord, uh, we can only cause it to be spread. We can only sow the seed. We have no control over the ground upon which it falls. But Lord, you're able today to break up fallow ground and to prepare every heart and make it ready to receive gleefully, gladly, a word from heaven that is able to ignite a fire in their soul that cannot be quenched. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus, Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The promise of the gospel today is that faith in Christ would bring the infilling of the Holy Ghost and power. The Holy Ghost and power are synonymous. Those two terms are synonymous. When you say Holy Ghost, you might as well say power. When you say power of God, you're talking about the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Word of God declares, and, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Twice in the Gospels, John the Baptist is recorded as having spoken of the promise of God to baptize his people 
with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Matthew 3.11, the Word of God declares, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The promise of the gospel today, my friend, goes far beyond simply believe this message. There are many churches and many denominations out there today that want to try to tell you that the message of the gospel is simply believe this message. No, that is not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is if you will believe this, you will receive this. Hallelujah. That's why Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent, turn around from unbelief. Turn around from a, a life filled with not acknowledging God as a reality. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist told his following that the one who came after him had bigger plans for us than John did. <laughs> oh, there were much bigger plans than merely baptizing with water, Bill. No, the one that came after John had a plan that would include baptizing us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. Whew. Our relationship with God by reason of the gospel of Jesus Christ is far more real than anything you could ever imagine. I've been in Pentecost my whole life. I was born and raised in a spirit-filled church. And I'm going to tell you, ever since I was a kid, God has been real to me. Miracles have been real to me. I don't worry about what doctors say because God has shown me over and over again that he's bigger than a doctor. Hallelujah. Amen. He's bigger than science. He's bigger than scientists. God is able to do what no doctor could ever do my whole life. I've watched miracle after miracle after miracle. This old preacher who knows for a fact that I have no power in me whatsoever to do anything and I claim no such power. I don't want it, don't need it. I got God who's able to work through me. Hallelujah. I don't need to have any power of my own. I don't need to make any claims of my own. But I've laid hands on people and prayed for them. I've seen people healed of brain cancer. I've seen people healed of breast cancer. I've seen women healed of ovarian cancer. I've seen babies healed of PKU. Oh my God, I could go down a list a mile long. I've seen God do so many things because this gospel is about far more than simply believing in this story we hear about a man named Jesus. No, if we believe in this man named Jesus, this man named Jesus is going to make himself powerful and real in our lives by baptizing us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This change in relationship was spoken of in the Old Testament by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. You see, the Jews had a relationship with God that was based on law. But Jeremiah prophesied, listen, 
Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Here's what Jeremiah prophesied. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. So the Lord said, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be based on the old covenant. It's not going to be like the old covenant that I made with the Jewish people coming out of Egypt as I led them by the hand into the promised land. He said, no, I'm going to make a new covenant. He said, by the way, that covenant, that contract, they broke it. <laughs> so he made an old covenant and we still got Jewish people today that are clinging to the covenant of the Old Testament they're clinging to the law and God says in Jeremiah this is Old Testament this, the Jewish people read this <laughs> and God declared they already broke that one they already broke that contract. But when you break a contract my friend I got news for you that contract becomes null and void Hello now. He continues, Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, listen, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. You see, according to the Old Testament law, there had to be regular sacrifices made for sins. Right. If you committed a certain offense, you had to uh, present a certain kind of sacrifice. If you broke the law in this manner, then you would have to bring a dove. If you broke the law in that manner, then you would have to bring a bullock or you would have to bring a lamb. There were different things that you would have to offer in sacrifice in response to different sins. Every year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would present a sacrifice before God in the Holy of Holies in that sacred, curtained-off place in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And that represented the very throne of God. That, that ark literally represented God's throne. It represented God's presence. And God's presence was behind that curtain. And the priest would have to go back. The high priest. God accepted no one else but the highest priest in the land. And he'd have to go back there with a sacrifice for the sins of Israel year after year after year. But listen, God said, according to my new contract, according to my new covenant, he said in verse 34, he said, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad when you've done business with Jesus that you don't have to go before God every year and offer a sacrifice for sins you thought you had already settled? Amen. Thank you. Glory to God. Right. No, sir. When you come to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, your sin, past, present, and future. Listen to me, saints. Your sins, past, present, and future are covered by the blood. Yes, thank you. Hallelujah. God looks at you and he sees you from that day forward as being sanctified and holy and righteous in his eyes. He doesn't see any sin. He sees only a son. Hallelujah. He changes the I into an O. <laughs> Glory to God. 
That's the covenant that God said. He said, I'm going to put my contract inside of them. You know how he does that? He does that by reason of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. said, the Word of God tells us that we have no need that any man teach us but the anointing which ye have received of him that abideth in you. Talking about the Holy Ghost baptism. The writer said, that anointing shall teach you all things said you don't need any man to teach you because God has put his spirit in you to teach you everything you need to know in verse 34 Jeremiah 31 and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. Oh, I'm so glad the gospel isn't reserved for the well-to-do. I'm so glad the gospel isn't reserved for the educated. I'm so glad today the gospel, the power of God in my life, has not been reserved for some certain segment of people. No, there are no, there are no classes in the kingdom of God. Word of God said, no, this new contract I have is going to apply from the least of them to the greatest of them. Hallelujah. Oh, then Paul speaks of this very prophecy. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, Paul writes, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Paul said if the first contract had worked, there'd be no need for a second. <clears throat> he said for finding fault with them, meaning the, the Jewish people, remember God said they broke this covenant? For finding fault with them, Paul's referring to the fact Israel broke the covenant. He saith, he saith, speaking of God, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. You recognize this? This is word for word what Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Continues. He said... Uh, in the day I, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, they broke it. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Listen. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. That means God is saying, I will have mercy on them when they don't do right. I got news for you, children. If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, if you've been to Calvary, if the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your life, God is merciful to your unrighteousness. That is the promise of the new covenant. Hallelujah. Amen. Even when you don't do right, God shows you mercy. Mm -hmm. yep. Woo, my Lord, have mercy. Take a mother, take a dad. They got a kid who can act up sometimes, and I mean passers-by and observers and other family members and neighbors and people who are strangers that don't know that kid and don't know that mom or that dad. Man, they'll want to grab that child and throttle them. You ever been in a restaurant, saw a kid acting up, and I mean you just about wanted to grab You say, I know what will fix that. I'll tell you what, I know what will fix that. That kid needs a good smack on their bottom. 
And you look over and there's mom. Now, Billy, honey, I know you're tired, sweetie. Just calm down and relax. We'll get you some. And you're sitting there saying, what's wrong with you? I know what will fix this if I tell you what my father used to grab a switch. And I mean, he beat that mess out of me in a flat hurry. My mother used to carry a belt in her purse. She didn't even have to pull it out. All she had to do was put her hand in the purse. And all of a sudden, boy, we'd straighten up in that frame. I know what will fix that problem. But if you would just put a belt in your purse, you'd have that kid acting right. But mom or dad is showing that kid mercy, and we don't understand where that mercy is coming from. We don't understand where that understanding is coming from. We don't understand where that patience is coming from. I'll tell you where it's coming from. It's coming, pardon me, talking so plain. It's coming from mommy's uterus. She gave birth to that baby, honey. That baby is her flesh. It is flesh of her flesh. That father is merciful because he gave that child life. I got news for you today. As a child of God, God shows be mercy even when I don't do right because I am flesh of his flesh. I'm born of the spirit. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. People say how can an LGBT person be saved? How can they be a Christian and live for God? It's that easy. Hallelujah. And if you don't understand it, Straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. If you don't understand it, then you don't get how this gospel works. That's right. God said, finishing out what Paul said in Hebrews 8 and 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more? Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the Old Testament prophet Joel said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I got news for you, children. It doesn't matter if your sons and daughters are straight or gay, if they're transgendered or bisexual. God said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. He didn't say all flesh that acted right, all flesh that, flesh that was perfect, all flesh that was sinless. He said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Hallelujah. Listen. Whew. Run out of breath. <laughs> your old men shall dream dreams. I'm going up. I'm in transition for prophecy to dreams. I don't want to claim I'm an old man yet. I feel like one sometimes. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This gospel's about a whole lot more than just believing the message. It's about a whole lot more than just believing that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man born unto a virgin, went to the cross for the sins of humanity, physically, literally died, gave up the ghost, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he put that robe of flesh right back on, and he folded, the Word of God said, that the grave clothes he had been wrapped in were folded and laid aside. He come out of the sky. Hallelujah. Woo! He wanted them to know, I got up and left this place on my own. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Nobody stole my body. You'd be an idiot to come in this room and try to take my body and leave my grave clothes folded up. 
You'd be crazy to take the time to fold my clothes up. Why would you do that? Got news for you. There ain't a Jew in the world that would have done that. I say, Pastor, why? I'll tell you why. Because the law prohibited you from touching a dead body. You couldn't take those grave clothes off, Johnny. Because if you did, you'd have to handle a dead body. Oh my goodness. See, I'm going to tell you, God's so smart. The Word of God is amazing. It, the details that are offered are offered for a reason, people. It's about more than believing He rose from the dead. It's about more than believing that He ascended to heaven. It's about more than believing that one day He's coming back for the church. No, you believe them things God said. Let me tell you what I'll do. If you'll believe this, you'll receive something from me. I'll put my contract inside of you. I'm not going to, going to be some contract out there somewhere. I'm going to put it down inside you. And when I put it down inside you, you're going to know me like you ain't never known me. Amen. Ooh. There's something about intimacy. You ever had somebody, I, I hope I'm going to try to be delicate. You ever had somebody you've been intimate with in your life? And maybe you didn't have a long-term relationship with them. Maybe you did. But after a while, they die. And word comes to you that they passed away. All of a sudden, you feel this this sadness, you feel this hole in you. Not because you spent years with that person per se. You may have, you may not have. But because you once shared in great intimacy with that person. Well, there's something about joining yourself together with somebody. Am I telling the truth? Do you understand what I'm getting at today? Bless God, Tommy was a virgin his whole life, still is. So he, he doesn't understand what I'm talking about. But there are some people out there, you, you get what I'm talking about, don't you? You've been into it, and then all of a sudden you find out they've died, and it, it just it, it hits you a certain way because you've known that person intimately. Had you not ever known that person intimately, the news of their death would have struck you entirely differently. I'm going to tell you, there is something about intimacy, and God knows that. That's why God doesn't want you just to believe this gospel. He wants you to believe it so you can receive the promise of the Holy Ghost and fire, which is the power of God. And I want to make myself so real to you. I want to get up inside of you. I want to get intimate with you. I don't want to just be intimate one day. I want to be intimate every day. I don't want to have an encounter. I want us to walk together united in spirit from the minute you receive my great Holy Ghost baptism till the day you die. I want our spirits to be married and joined together so that for the rest of your life, you can know me in a powerful and intimate way. Joel said in the Old Testament, the day would come after that new contract was established that God said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. In Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, responding to the queries of those who were in Jerusalem to celebrate the uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. And Peter, the Word of God said, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. So in other words, he said, you people who are from Judea, Israel, you people who are from this land, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Well, I got news for you. 
the Romans occupied Israel at this time. They occupied Palestine at this time. There were many Romans who lived in Jerusalem. So what Peter had to say now applied not only to the Jews, but he said, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. You hear me now. You say, well, why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because the Roman Catholic Church will try to tell you that Jesus' name, baptism, only applied to the Jews. That was something that was only meant for the Jews. Wrong. Wrong. The Word of God makes it abundantly clear. That what Peter had to say, he had to say to everybody regardless of where they were from. Regardless of their nationality. Regardless of their skin color. He continued, Be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. They were doing something that led people to believe they were drunk. Now, I don't know about you, I lived in New York City for 10 years. I used to get on the subway, and on the subway there'd be people over here speaking Polish. There'd be people over here speaking German. There'd be people over here speaking Russian. There'd be people over here speaking Korean. I could be on one subway car and literally hear five different languages being spoken. Never one time did I assume that because they were speaking another language, they were drunk. Not once did I ever see somebody speaking another language and say to myself, Boy, is he bombed. <laughs> Peter continues, listen, Acts chapter 2, 14 through 18. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's referring back to what we just read. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Whew. If we want the power of God. In the church today, and I don't know about you, but this preacher wants the power of God in the church today. Amen. If we want the fire of the Holy Ghost to be present in the church today, I'm going to tell you a little secret. We need to bring wood for the fire. We need to bring wood for the fire. Pastor, what do you mean by bring wood for the fire? I'll tell you what I mean. Preach the cross. Preach the cross. There's the wood you need to bring. Preach the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I was raised in Pentecost. I've been in this movement my whole life. I have for 54 years watched it gradually decline and die. I've seen preachers, big name preachers, famous preachers, powerful preachers, in major Pentecostal denominations. I've seen them try to explain away the lack of power in the church today. I've seen them try to explain away and make excuses for the lack of fire in the churches today. At the beginning of this movement, at the turn of the 20th century as the Holy Ghost began to fall on groups of people around the world simultaneously. 
and people began to experience the Holy Ghost baptism with the initial physical evidence of speaking with other tongues, speaking in other languages. It's no big mystical thing, folks. But they speak in another language, a language they've never learned, as the Spirit of God enables them to do so. Folk used to act kind of crazy. There was a term for us Pentecostal people back in the day called holy rollers. Some of them people, bless God, they'd roll all over the ground like they were on fire. And they'd just roll on the ground laughing and shouting and hollering and making all kind of noise. Some of them would leap and some of them would dance and some of them would run around the sanctuary. And some, I've seen people get happy in the Holy Ghost and jump up on a pew and dance on the back of the pew straight. Not on the seat on the little piece of wood on the back, at the top of the back. You ain't got but two and a half inches of wood. And it ain't flat. I've seen people get happy in the Holy Ghost, jump up on a pew and start dancing on that little piece of wood. <coughs> well, preacher, that's just stupid. I've seen people write on Facebook and other places. People who grew up in the Pentecostal movement. Oh, I remember the day when all the church folk would act all crazy and stupid. They weren't acting crazy and stupid. They believed something deeper than you'll ever believe in. They had something inside of them apparently you ain't got. They were feeling a power that you've never felt. I felt it. I know what it feels like. And honey, I'm going to tell you something. These people are not drunken with wine as ye suppose. Hallelujah. When God pours out the Holy Ghost and fire, I'm going to tell you, your body won't even be able to contain what's happening in your spirit. You're going to react one way or another. You may let out a whoop and a shout. You may begin to dance. You may begin to run. You may begin to roll on the ground. You may begin to shake your head or do something. But honey, something's going to happen. <coughs> Those people weren't out there doing all that just to be doing it, Bill, Johnny. Trust me. I was pastoring my, let me see, I got to do the math in my head. First thing, a third church. I was in a little community, a college community in Pennsylvania. We were meeting in a <coughs> uh, Grange Hall. Some of y'all might know what the Grange is if you're familiar with being out in a rural part of the country. The Grange at one time back in the 18 and early 1900s, that was uh, the social center for any community. The Grange is they build a little meeting hall and that's where all the farmers and all the people from the community would come and they'd have dances and they'd have picnics and they'd have barbecues. You know, that's how you'd have social events back in the day. And, and it would bring the community together. And we were renting out an old Grange Hall. The organization today is virtually dead. It hardly even exists. And I think it still exists, but barely by a string. And there were these old folks that lived right next door to the Grange Hall. Brother and Sister Carpenter, they were in their 80s. She found out we were having church next door to where she lived. And that Grange Hall was out, it was out of town by about six miles. She said, oh, convenient. Here's a church I can go to that's close. So she began to come. This was early in my affirming days. I was trying to find my footing in terms of an affirming message. She began to come. Her husband would come with her every once in a while, but he didn't come regular like she did. One Sunday, 
a preacher that I knew who pastored a mainstream apostolic church about 30 to 40 minutes away. He brought some of his folks and some of his musicians and what have you to our church for us to have a fellowship meeting. See, back in the day, churches used to have fellowship meetings. We'd get together. We weren't competing with one another. We were working together to accomplish the work of God. We we're having a fellowship meeting. Brother McCoy brought folks and musicians and all. And boy, I mean to tell you, we had us a church service. We started worshiping God and the Spirit of the Lord fell. I mean, we shouted all over that place. We danced. We ran. We leaped. We did all kind of crazy things. These people are not drunken with wine as you suppose. It's not what you think it was. If you think it's as simple as people acting stupid, I got news for you. No, it's much more than that. Much, much, much more than that. And Brother Carpenter had come that night. And I looked at Brother Carpenter sitting back there with his wife, and tears are streaming down his face. And as he left the service, I shook his hand. I said, well, brother, I said, I hope you enjoyed the service tonight. He said, that was amazing. That was wonderful. That was the most terrific thing. He said, my God, you worshiped like we used to worship when I was a kid. This man's in his 80s. I said, worship like you worship when you were a kid. I said, what kind of church did you go to when you were a kid? Listen, Bill, he said, Methodist. He said, that's the way the Methodists used to worship. When I was a young person, they shouted, they ran, they danced, they rejoiced. He said, my God, they made a racket. There was such a power in the service. There was such a move of God. God would make himself so, so real in that place that you couldn't contain what you were feeling. And he literally wept tears of joy telling me this. Got news for you today. There are people in the Pentecostal movement today who have never seen a saint shout. They wouldn't know what it looked like for somebody to shout because they never laid eyes on it. They have never seen anyone dance under the anointing and the direction of the Holy Ghost. They've never seen anybody, brother, who had a platonium hip replacement and could barely walk like Brother Red Collins in the Church of God here in Texas used to. They never saw Brother Collins like I did come up to the pulpit every camp meeting. His hip worked on a big old, you know, ball, and he would literally, this is how his hip would do, you know. And he'd come up every camp meeting, they wanted him to lead the choir in a song. And every camp meeting, he led the choir in the same song. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Long may my wandering heart rejoice. Oh, happy day, happy day. Since Jesus washed my sins away. You know why there was power in those services? You know why the fire of the Holy Ghost was burning in those services? I'll tell you why. Because they were bringing wood for the fire. They were preaching the cross. They were singing the cross. They were celebrating the cross. They were preaching uh, Trump. They weren't preaching politics. They weren't preaching world events. They weren't preaching about some kind of a warfare going on in our society. And when you sing and preach the cross, the fire of God falls. And Brother Collins with his hip could barely walk. He walked with the king. All of a sudden, You'd see him and he'd move over to the organist and he'd slam on that organ. Play that thing! He'd start getting happy. And he'd come over to the piano 
and he'd say, now you play this piano. And he'd be leading that choir. All of a sudden, Brother Collins would let off and he'd start running around the Church of God Tabernacle in Weatherford, Texas. Great, big, enormous room. And he would run around that tabernacle about three or four times before finally coming back to the front of the church, finishing the song, and going back to his seat. But you know what? When he ran, <laughs> you didn't see this business going on. That man ran like he was a 12-year-old kid. You didn't know he had a replacement in his hip. Because when the power of God touches you, I'm going to tell you something. Honey, there are things you can do in your body you can never do any other way. No, these men are not drunken as she supposed. I'm sorry that in the Pentecostal movement today, I don't even feel comfortable going in and visiting uh, Pentecostal churches today that I don't know, that I'm not familiar with. You know why? Because I know how to worship God. I know how to get in the Spirit. I know how to be happy in the Holy Ghost. If the Lord touches me, if the power of God touches me, honey, I'm going to get happy. And I'm terrified to walk into a church I don't know because if I get happy, those idiots might ask me to leave. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't apologize for the Pentecostal movement one iota. I don't apologize for one single saint that's ever let out a whoop. I don't apologize for one child of God that shouted till the roof thought it was going to fall down. I don't apologize for one old saint. I've seen saints in the church and God bless their heart. Oh, we got people now and they say, well, I just don't feel up to worship and I don't feel like giving God everything to worship. I remember Sister Macaulay. Sister Macaulay was in her 80s and Sister Macaulay would get out and dance across that whole church and she wouldn't dance for two minutes or five minutes minutes or 10 minutes, honey, she'd be going for 30 minutes in her 80s. I'm living with diabetes. I'm living with this. I'm living with that. I'm living with cancer. I'm going to tell you something. If the Holy Ghost touches me, I don't care what I'm living with. I'm still going to shout. I'm still going to run. I'm still going to dance. I don't apologize for one thing that's ever occurred in this movement. There's a reason I don't try to preach people into a frenzy. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is such a thing as wildfire. Meaning a fire that's not controlled. There is such a thing as wildfire, a fire that God didn't start. Can a preacher get up and preach and get everybody worked up into an emotional frenzy? Yep, he can. Look at a Trump rally. Look at the way people scream and holler and carry on at a Trump rally. Go to a Dallas Stars game. Funny, you see people, wow, wow, screaming and hollering. Not one person said, boy, is she drunk. No, she's got cause to scream like that. Because after all, that man just hit a little black piece of rubber into a net. Go to a Dallas Cowboys game. People paint their face half blue, half gray. Got stars painted on the side of their head. They shave their head and they put Dallas on the back of it. They run around with big beer bellies and their belly is uncovered and they got the number of their favorite team member on there. Let the Cowboys start, score a touchdown, then people scream and holler and carry on like the world just come to an end, am I telling the truth? But people who are full of the Holy Ghost and fire, people who are experiencing the power of God 
aren't supposed to have any kind of rejoicing going on. They're not supposed to shout. They're not supposed to get happy. They're not supposed to dance. They're not supposed to run. They're not supposed to act crazy. Oh, no, no, no. See, I've been taught in church we're supposed to act a certain way. Oh, honey, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Let me tell you about this preacher. I'm trying to bring it to a close, I promise. I don't preach people into a frenzy. I don't do these emotional altar calls. I don't try to take advantage of emotional moments. I hate that crap. And it is crap. I hate it. See, I want to tell you a little secret. I've seen the power of God. I've seen the real thing. When you've seen the fire of God fall, honey, there ain't nothing in the world better than the real thing. Used to be an ad on TV said, there ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> there ain't nothing like the real thing. I've preached in churches. You know how I end our services? We say, all right, you preach, uh, pray at the end of the message, and I sit down, or I, we're done. Why, pastor, don't you know you're not supposed to do that? You're supposed to stand there and cajole people to the altar. You're supposed to stand there and give these big, pitiful, emotional pleas to get people to come to the altar. Oh, you're supposed to create an atmosphere. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to... Baloney. Tell you the best advice, Brother J.T. Gillum of the Riverside Church of God, the greatest man of God probably I've ever known in my life. I used to watch the Holy Ghost fall at that church like, good Lord, I can't even tell you what it was. It was the most marvelous thing in the world to be part of that church. Every Sunday you left the house of God and honey, God was ten times realer to you today than He was yesterday. Every Sunday. Saw drug addicts walk in the door, come down the altar, get filled with the Holy Ghost, begin to speak with other tongues of the Spirit of God, give them the utterance, walk out the door never to touch a drug again so long as they live. Drugs, same thing happened. Saw a Baptist preacher's wife come in visiting one time because... She knew one of the ladies in our church, and the lady in our church invited her to come visit. And the Baptist preacher's wife came. And before she left that service, she had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and was speaking with other tongues. And her husband thought she was crazy and had lost her mind. He was a Baptist preacher. We don't believe in that! Three weeks later, here comes the Baptist preacher into that same church telling the church, I want you to pray for me that I can have what my wife's got. My wife has never been more in love with Jesus. My wife has never wanted to live better. She's never wanted to be better. She's never wanted to be more like the Lord than she does today. Said so the change in her has been phenomenal said, I want what she got, and we prayed him through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Got to pick on you a minute, Bill. I got Johnny, because he's from Baptist, but now I'm going to get you. I'm teasing. I only say that because it happens this way. There was a Methodist lady coming to church. There was a Methodist church right next door to the Church of God. This lady was coming to church one Sunday. She told us later how this happened. <laughs> she said, I was coming to church. I've been going to this church my whole life. She said, I've been part of the Methodist church for 60 years. She said, I was coming to church this one Sunday, and I parked my car in the Methodist parking lot, and she said, and I swear to God, the voice that God spoke to me is, I want you to go to that church today. She said, so I left my car in the Methodist parking lot, walked across the road, went into the Riverside Church of God, and before she left, she was Pentecostal, not in name but by experience. Hallelujah. She had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And she died Pentecostal. I'm going to tell you something. Don't tell me the church is in as good a shape as it's ever been because it's not. Don't tell me the church is where it ought to be because it's not. Don't tell me that the power of God is in the Pentecostal movement today what it ought to be and what it always has been because you're a liar and I don't care if you're T.D. Jakes or if you're T.L. Lowry or if you're who you are. 
I don't care if you're the top preacher in the United Pentecostal denomination, you're lying. If you dare say the church is today what it ought to be, you're lying. The good news is we can fix this problem. The good news is that this is not irreparable. This, if we want to see a restoration of the power of God, if we want to see a restoration of the move of God and the baptism of the Holy Ghost with fire and power and glory, all we've got to do is bring wood for the fire. Get back to preaching the cross. Get out of all your other messaging. Get out of all your other niches. Get out of all your uh, claiming that you're fighting a war. I've heard preachers tell me, Well, but the Word of God said Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Yeah, he sure was. And look how effective he was. Eight people wound up on the ark. He was no Billy Graham. what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to preach righteousness. Oh, uh, no. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, meaning Noah preached, these are the right things you ought to do. This is how you ought to live. Guess what? Noah was before the law of Moses. Noah wasn't even under the law of Moses. Noah was before the law of Moses. Um, the message of righteousness was right for that hour. It was not right after the law came. Oh my goodness. I hope there's some Pentecostal nitwit watching me on this thing right now. And it was not the message of the New Testament. The message of the New Testament is the cross. You wonder why your church is dead. You wonder why the Spirit of God isn't moving in the house of God like He used to. You wonder why you're not seeing people filled with the Holy Ghost, people healed, people delivered, people saved like they used to be. Uh, it's simple. You are not bringing wood for the fire. You're bringing all kinds of other garbage. But that stuff don't burn. Word of God said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You have no power, I'll tell you why you're not preaching the cross. It's that simple. It's that simple. I guarantee you it's that simple. You know why Riverside Church of God used to have the move of God we used to have? Because the thing we talked about more than anything was the cross. The thing we lifted up more than anything was the cross. The thing we glorified more than anything was the cross. We didn't preach about culture wars. We didn't preach about politics. We didn't preach about Donald Trump. We didn't preach about current events. We preached the cross. And the power of God fell consistently, constantly in the house of God. And we saw incredible things happen. If we want the power of God, the fire of God, the power of the Holy Ghost to be present in the church, we must bring wood for the fire. We've got to preach the cross. The cross supplies the wood that fuels the flames of the Holy Ghost. Preaching politics won't do it. Preaching Trump won't do it. Preaching current events won't do it. Culture war sermons and sermons on the evil that men do will not do it. The message today is not live right as Noah preached, nor is it to obey the law. The message today is to preach the cross.